Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. From Luke 18. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extorters, un unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm guessing that you might know what kind of sermon's coming your way. You might have even heard this sermon before. It's the sermon where it's like, are you the Pharisee or are you the tax collector? Okay, but there's a problem with that sermon that I could not overcome this week. The problem is simply this. You are the tax collector and you know it. You are not the Pharisee. There is nothing in you that would behave like that pharisaical man. Now, I know there are issues in our lives and sin that can come in and creep. But to pray that way, to self-justify yourself in that way, and to look down on others that way, is it's just not who we are. And I know that. You're not bragging how good you are. I've never heard any of you brag that. You... You don't believe it, confess it, or behave in such a way. You are the hero in the parable, but the irony or the, the great reversal of the parable is the hero. The one that we want to be like is the tax collector. That's the shocking part of it. And at this point, because I know that I've made my point, and you see that, I actually would love to say right now, amen, and move on. However... I feel that you would think I did not work this week if I did that, and that I was being lazy, which I am not. And I do have a few more things to say anyways. There was a, a story that I love, and I use it all the time, of a man, uh, his name is John uh, um, Grout. He was a great public speaker, and he tells this story. It's his story, but I love it so much. It's about him sitting in church in a city, maybe like Chicago or Pittsburgh. And as church starts, a man uh, sits next to him who is crippled in the pew. And he looks rough. Maybe someone actually living on the street, if not on the edge. And the hymn, Just As I Am, uh, is playing. And this crippled man sang with all of his heart this song. Except, the, uh, John said, his heart was in it, but his voice was uh, not the most skilled of singers. Does that, you get, I, I don't want to be mean. And neither did John, actually. And the second stanza comes, and the, and the man goes, can you give me the first few words? Because he's holding the hymnal, and John gives it, and he goes, oh, thank you, I'm blind. And he knew the whole hymn, and sang with all of his heart. And afterwards, John declared that no man on his life, will, he will never hear another man sing that song, just as I am, as beautifully as that blind and crippled man sang it that day. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. You see, the quality wasn't in the voice, it wasn't there. And equality wasn't in the self-righteousness of the man or the quality of the man. He was a man struggling in this world. The quality was is that that man sang that song with the certainty that Christ loves him just as I am. It's powerful stuff. It's the thing that tax collector went into that temple begging God for. John said, by the way, at the end of that service, for the, he lost his self-righteousness that day. He understood God in ways that he did not before in God's people. 
That, that is why we come to worship here, to look to Jesus on the cross, to see our salvation in that man and not our own works. We don't give our love to others because it's going to get, gain salvation. We do give our love to others, but never to gain salvation. Christ and Him alone did it. And we respond in kind. Or, to put a pin in it, you can't save yourself, but you do have a Savior. We in this parable see ourselves as the damsel in distress, are we not? For the men in this congregation, maybe it's an odd position to find yourself as the damsel in distress. We are the ones in the tower locked away. We're the ones sleeping. We're the ones that need rescuing. We are not self-made when it comes to our faith. We're not self-sufficient when we come to our faith. We're not self-righteous when we come to our faith. We see ourselves in the tax collector. And thankfully, Jesus declares, and Jesus alone can do this, declares the tax collector righteous. That's what he does for you. He has declared it so. Jesus has saved you. He saved sinners. That is the point of the cross, in fact. There was a great Dutch and Swedish statesman from the 16th century. Ooh, I'm going to see how your history is. Not good. It, it's your biology. So I could be lying completely, Ulla, and you won't be able to know. Uh, Hugo Grotus, G-R-O-T-I-U-S. Is it kicking an aim? That's okay. It, he's pretty small. If you don't know, Ulla's from Sweden, so. Um, and it's 1600s. You know, we Americans have a shorter history, that's why we know it all. <laughs> but on his way back, he was a great statesman, and on the way back to Sweden from a trip, his boat becomes shipwrecked. And when he's shipwrecked, he's laying, he's getting himself healthy, he's just trying to get back to Sweden for his family, as you can imagine. And it's become clear that he's not going to make it. He's going to die on the island that he's at. They can't get him back to Sweden in time. And so a local pastor, a Lutheran pastor, comes to minister to him as he is dying. And as he's dying, they're laying between consciousness and unconsciousness, between life and eternity. The local pastor read the text I just read to you earlier. That text. An interesting bedside text for someone who's dying. But then at that point, Hugo's eyes opened up and he looks right at the pastor and he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Hugo's last words it was this, the tax collector, Lord, am I? Powerful. It's who we are. It's our identity. It's how... We come to Christ and how Christ comes to us and how Christ fixes us. We Christians are a funny lot. I'll admit that. We're a funny lot, we Christians. We uh, look at the hero in the story and it's not the hero everyone else would have picked. Uh, we are sinners begging God. Wouldn't, shouldn't the hero be the righteous one? He tithed. He was good. He was in the middle of the church, bold in his prayer even. No, we're a funny lot. We don't see ourselves as that, as our hero. God's church is kind of this way. God has picked you all and brought you together knowing that you're sinners. You confessed your sins earlier today, did you not? as did I. You made it publicly known that you've gone to God, that you have fallen short in thought, word, and deed, as have I. And we made it public, by the way. There's no uh, little room that you can go off to. This was a public act. 
It is so strange that when people talk to me about Christianity, confession and absolution is never seen as part of our faith, even though every Sunday we chart out every service with that. I don't know why it is. I have my guesses. And you receive every Sunday the forgiveness of sins in Christ. It's announced to you. You receive it in the sacrament as well. It is a gift that is given over and over. As if Jesus knows us so well that he knows that we need to hear you're forgiven a lot. And he gives it over and over. He announces it. He puts it in front of you. But Jesus has called us and enlightened us to receive this faith because of God's love for us through Jesus. And now, I made a mistake a little earlier on. I said that we are sinners. That's halfway true. We are both sinners and saints. For we come into that temple like that tax collector, a sinner, and we'll leave this congregation still a singer, sinner at the end of this service, but we're also saints of God through the work of Jesus Christ. He left this church, the temple, the tax collector, justified, righteous, made right by God. And so you will as you leave today as well. Let me give you one final illustration and I'll say my amen. There was a very wealthy Lutheran church that needed to hire an organist. Um, Diane, I'm sorry, they, they, they've hired the position. You can't leave. You gotta stay. And they put it out and there were two organists who applied for the job and it was a well-paying job, by the way. And one was a man who had just received his PhD in music with his primary instrument, the organ. And he was amazing. And the other one was Mabel. Mabel was a 75-year-old self-taught organist who had played an organ in a congregation almost her entire life. And they were in front of the committee to pick who was going to get this job. They had two parts to it. The first one was they were to play a piece of music. Uh, and the PhD student, he played a beautiful, technically challenged, perfectly played organ piece. No doubt about it. And Mabel, she played very well. She played two hymns that are just basic hymns that we all know and sing. And she might have made a mistake, one little spot, but pretty clean. And they're looking there, but then they had to have, afterwards, they were interviewed, and all they had was one question. What's your favorite hymn and why? The PhD student picked the hardest hymn in the hymn book to play, and he explained how technically difficult it was and how he enjoyed conquering the notes and making it just sing those notes. And that was a wonderful answer. And then they asked Mabel. Mabel thought about it for a minute, and she goes, uh, I like hymn 570. It makes me cry. It reminds me of who I am and what Jesus has done for me. Well, I think you know who got hired. Mabel. The church is so weird like that, isn't it? But it's who, they weren't looking for the most technically perfect person. They were looking for the person whose life reflects what Christ has done for them, which has saved them. Mabel had that. We are the tax collector. Thanks be to God. And our hearts are now full with the same joy that man had in leaving that temple knowing that Christ had forgiven him. And by the way, just if you want to, in the next few minutes, hymn number 570 is a good hymn after all. Feel free to look it up if you want. God's blessings to you. May the certainty that Christ died for your sins, rose from the grave victorious, and has given you his righteousness be on your hearts and minds always. Amen.